Tom Kurz is an astronomer at the Royal Observatory Greenwich in London. Founded in 1675, it's one of the most important scientific sites in the world. Tom's also authored books including Moon Gazing, Beginner's Guide to Exploring the Moon. If space is his passion, then failing to communicate that is his fear. My first love is really stargazing, actually, and the relationship between humans and the night sky, uh, which is something that's becoming increasingly fraught in the modern world, mostly because of the development of light pollution, the urbanisation of the world, essentially. So we're being cut off from the night sky, and at the same time, there's a sort of increasing thirst mm. to, I suppose, to canonise human beings within the cosmos. We want to know where we fit in. That's something that's been going on for thousands of years, but it's actually only relatively recently that we have such a complete picture. And that picture, I think, is very motivating and inspiring for many. It's also something that gives us a, a common sort of uh, backbone that all human beings share. Mm -hmm. And I want to try and get that message to as many people as possible. That's, that's what I, I inspire people to, to think about it. I want to ask you if you figured it out, but you probably haven't figured it out yet. But what, you know, when you sit there looking up at the stars, have you come up with any sort of train of thought which might lead you to that answer? People have looked at the stars for so long and there, is, there are so many, there is so much evidence for the history of the reverence of the stars. When we look at, for example, the constellations, we see heroic archetypes in the stars uh, from stories told to, to generations to inspire them. We see creatures that people used to revere, animals like the lion, which was seen across many different cultures in the same part of the sky. And we also see evidence of our own history of our civilization. We see nods to the fact that the stars... Uh, were used in agriculture, for example, which without which we wouldn't have the civilization that we live in today, um, and the, the concept of the stars as a calendar. And so when I look at the stars, I can see all of that history in there. But what we know today, and the, the benefit of our modern view that uh, these ancient people didn't have, is that we also see the stars as real places. And increasingly, we're seeing them as real places that people might one day go or, or that someone might already be inhabiting. So we're now looking out at the universe in terms of other solar systems and other worlds and it's just, for me, it's, it's very curious to look up at the stars and recognise that they are distant suns. Uh, the vast majority of them have planets and some small fraction of them have planets that are very similar to our own and they're already there and finding them is just a matter of technological progress and people continuing the search. So it's not like these things are coming to be. Mm. They're already waiting to be discovered, and it's just a matter of how passionate people are, how much they're willing to invest, you know, sort of money-wise in building large telescopes, but also their own time and passion and careers. And I'm just very excited about what's going to be discovered in the future. When did you start looking up at the stars and want this career? I was very young. Uh, I had the, the luxury, actually, I would say, I think it is a luxury um, to grow up in a very rural place, at least for part of my upbringing. And that was actually the north of Scotland uh, on the coast of Inverness. And from there, if you go to the beach uh, at Lossiemouth, you can actually see on a very, very clear night, you can see a hint of the aurora on the horizon, the northern lights actually just glowing on the horizon. My dad was a pilot and he uh, used to fly missions out of the north of Scotland uh, with the RAF and they would fly up over the Arctic and he talked about how the, the lights were visible and you could occasionally see them from the cockpit of a, of a fighter jet which must have been just an incredible experience and for me for me that lent a sort of mystical quality to the night sky so when I was young I was always interested and when I got a bit older I started to get things like binoculars and telescopes and get involved and it was just sort of a downward spiral into <laughs> obsession from there really uh, but when I went to university in particular I had the opportunity to study astrophysics and I would recommend that subject to anybody who's remotely curious anybody who enjoys the physical sciences because you get to ask and answer really quite strange and wonderful questions mm. about the universe and it's very difficult not to think about those for the rest of your life no matter what you do with your career uh, you'll always be thinking crikey that's so when you read a story, for example, about black holes colliding, you're, you're able to sort of visualize that and you think this is really happening or really did happen. And then those physical events are made very real and uh, it's hard not to kind of get consumed by those thoughts. But I think that's a positive thing. I'm trying to <laughs> I'm trying to make it sound positive. Maybe it's maybe it is an obsession, but I'd say it's a fairly wholesome one. Um, a lot of kids would like to do what you're doing. You've managed to do it. What was it that allowed you to sort of see that through and not be put off from your mission over time, do you think? 
I think that uh, it's important to recognise that science and being a scientist is a fantastic career. It's not often the way that it's been portrayed in fiction. Um, scientists are not zany people in white lab coats, for example. They're very normal. They're just like you and me. And uh, scientists uh, and working within the sciences has its tedious moments, has its thrilling moments, like any job. Uh, it's going to be it's going to have its ups and downs, but it's a job where you are effectively exercising your mind for a living. And it, that's really exciting. Uh, you're also doing a job where you can potentially discover new things. And while you might be working for a very long time on things that are already established, the longer you work, the more opportunities you'll have to do something really new, something really transformative. So what I would say to anyone who's interested in pursuing science is to essentially stick with it in the sense that, uh, you know, that it will always have its exciting moments. Um, working as an astronomer is extremely exciting, uh, regardless what you're doing. You could be sitting in an office, but if you're downloading data from a telescope that's in space and then being the first person on Earth to analyze that data and with p perhaps all sorts of potential secrets hidden away, that's a really exciting and motivating thought. Um, I think also astronomy is a great one to pursue because you have this visual connection to it. If you're interested in stargazing, you can go out and you can just enjoy the beauty of the sky and then you can go to work and you can discover the new secrets that are hidden within it. And that's quite unique for a, for a subject to pursue. Um, to young people, I would simply say my advice is stick with your maths. Maths is very important and we know that people who, who do well at maths, and I can't credit myself as one of them, I struggled a lot, I had to get extra help with my maths, but anybody who, who sticks with maths will do better in pretty much any subject they choose, but particularly within the sciences. And, and also, if you're interested in computers, if you're interested in coding, you know, explore those hobbies. Uh, really help, really develop them. They're really going to help you later on. Uh, if you're interested in problem solving at all, then I think, you know, the sciences and, and astronomy being the oldest of all the sciences is a really good direction for you. For sure. Talk a bit about struggling with maths, but was there a moment when you really thought, actually, you're up against some sort of barrier you're not going to be able to overcome? Personally, when I did struggle with my maths, I really didn't think I would necessarily have the opportunity to, to follow that passion to be sort of a physicist. I was really lucky because I had something which I think cannot be, the value of which cannot be overstated. And in the education sector, it's called science capital. And science capital means that you're, usually your parents or your guardians, they um, take an interest in your learning outside of school. So for example, my dad, who himself is very interested in engineering as a, as a pilot and an, an aeronautical engineer, he would uh, talk to me about science and he would take me to the science museum in London which I fell in love with as a, a very young child and he would also uh, he would help me I suppose he would give me extracurricular help yeah. sit down with me and solve problems with me in my homework and so on and uh, that meant that I suppose with with his support I was able to you know get the grades that I needed and actually as a very lazy student mm. I could have done a lot better than I than I did I was extremely lazy uh, as, a, as a student but then actually going to study um, something like astrophysics and then I went on to do my postgrad in spacecraft engineering it's really just uh, it's it's about looking at the courses that are available um, and seeing what's you know, really inspires you and looking at what previous generations of students have done and maybe just speaking to some of them or reading their interviews and, and, and reading in those uh, guides that the universities produce. So for me, um, the, the major barrier, I suppose, was pretty much my own laziness. Uh, and uh, that was something that I, I had to overcome. Um, and I think that's something that anybody can sympathize with. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I would say that, you know, if you're going into the sciences, as long as you're passionate about it, you will succeed. And I think that when it comes to, for example, working in astronomy and particularly in science communication, I can really vouch for that um, mm -hmm. because I'm maybe not the best person to be doing it, uh, but I'm extremely passionate about it. And I've had enough years now in the sector to see that the people who are passionate really do well mm -hmm. in that sector. If you really love um, sharing your knowledge with people, if you really love uh, discovering new things and, and being on the forefront of that, then you will succeed as a scientist or a science communicator. I'm um, sure of it. I've got a theory that um, a lot of drive comes from fear. It might be, in your case, being bored behind a desk in a job that you don't particularly like or, or something else. What is it that keeps you going in this particular line of work? Yeah, well, you do hit the nail on the head. I absolutely cannot do a basic desk job I just can't do it and I also can't really do a job that doesn't give me the opportunity to to think about big questions uh, so why is that do you think I I don't know I just uh, I I do get bored um, I get irritated by uh, by looking at small problems um, I think it's partially it's a flaw within my own character that I, I'm not very good at uh, you know solving those sorts of problems uh, 
it's it's really hard to pin that one down but it's a very good question and uh, i do think that you're quite right that people are afraid of getting stuck um, i would love to you know go on and do bigger and better things all the time for me i think my my biggest fear is not reaching a big enough audience and actually getting that message out there and the message getting lost in some way um, so that you know is always driving me to to explore so the stuff that you're learning you want to share and your fear is that you know you're not going to be able to share these discoveries that you're making in this you know big universe essentially yeah i think that um there is there's a latent fear within all sciences that and this is actually bears out in what we research that um science is not being communicated effectively enough i mean there's such a, a widespread skepticism of science that we see around the world and there are all sorts of reasons why people are skeptical uh, but they've really no good reasons to be skeptical so getting the message out there and explaining to people that science is something that they can all engage with if they want to and they can actually make a career out of it if they're if they're sort of passionate and curious people um, making sure that that message is clear i think is something that we all worry about uh, within the community of science and science communication in terms of um sort of real fears the, the the real fear we have is that people will go and go and make decisions which are predicated on an ignorance of science uh, and that's really sad because we live in the information age where access to information is actually very easy um, and even access to experts within the sciences there are some wonderful experts out there but they're perhaps not the best people to be mm. communicating their own research because they struggle with uh, sort of making it accessible as mm. it were and that's improving because now experts themselves have more access to the kind of training they need to become better communicators but luckily we have the field that I work in which is SciComm as we call it or science communication where the whole purpose of, of my job is to look at what's being discovered and found out and trying to make it accessible for the public, for schools, for the media mm -hmm. as well. So um, I think just making sure that relationship stays healthy with the media, the science communication and the academics, the researchers themselves, and keeping that chain open and keeping that communication flowing is, is sort of the secret to avoiding our worst case scenario. And that's become a challenge, hasn't it? Because quest uh, experts are being questioned, facts are being questioned, and challenge in a way that they haven't been before. Spin has become a huge thing, and now it's affecting science as much as politics, for example. Yeah, and part of it is probably down to the fact that uh, when it comes to politics, there are there are all sorts of moral judgments that people make, which informs their own political worldview. Um, science is not so concerned with that, but it does get wrapped up into it. So as a result, there are uh, political... Um, reasons that people have and proclaim to distrust science one way or the other and that's worrying because science is a sort of apolitical pursuit in a very real sense but it may well be that science informs politics and i think um, healthy politics is what i would call evidence-based politics where we simply consult the scientific consensus and follow it mm. you know, if the scientific consensus tells us something i think uh, history has shown us that it's got very great utility and can really help us and all the technology that we have right now is a testament to that. So why not employ that to make our political decisions to the best of our ability and maybe to be a little bit emotionally dispassionate at times, but but understand that we're kind of acting in the best interests of everyone. Um, so, yes, there, there is also anti-intellectualism, which may be on the rise. I'm not an expert. I, I couldn't say for sure. I know, you know the world population goes up. I'm sure there are gonna, there's going to be more anti-intellectualism. And it may be that we're living in an age where it's actually getting worse. Uh, and, you know, we also have, there are certain fringe theories about space, which are becoming more and more popular, and they thrive in, you know, very anti-scientific regions yeah. like like YouTube on the internet, yeah. uh, where the standard of evidence is very, very low, but the desire to believe things that are very odd or conspiratorial is very, very high. Mm. And where that crosses over, we have a tipping point, which is uh, something we want to push back against, you know, as science communicators. Uh, finally, you've had a chance to work with some you know, incredible, famous scientists. Uh, what would you say is the, you've seen uh, that they have in common? What makes a successful scientist? I have to say, this is, and I know this is the, a fact, and if anyone disagrees with me, I will challenge them to a debate. The, what makes a successful scientist, without question, is passion. Uh, it more so than, than intelligence, more so than uh, grades at school, I think those things are overrated. I really do. I think passion is what makes a successful scientist because a successful scientist is somebody that is willing to explore, to do the dirty work, the grind, to take data, to evaluate data, to repeat the experiment, 
and also to be a little bit humble about it, such that uh, if the experiment doesn't bear out, then to be able to throw away that hypothesis and say, you know what, I was wrong. I think we can all take, there are some great examples in history, and my favourite would be Niels Bohr, a Danish physicist, whose own model of the atom was effectively demolished with his own, within his own career lifetime. And he could have stuck to his model emotionally and, and really suffered for the late, later part of his life, but he did quite the opposite, which would have been painful at the time, and simply said, I was wrong, and this new view surpasses what I believed. And he actually became a strong advocate uh, within this new model. And it's just a wonderful story because he was able to admit, you know, that mm. ultimately evidence and I experiment are the important things. So, but passion is so important because science is hard and it is challenging and it, and it has its setbacks and uh, passion will always get you through that. Um, so, yes, passion is my number one thing. And, and that's why I would just say if anybody out there and particularly to younger listeners who are thinking about their careers, you know, if you're passionate about something um, and if it's something that can be investigated using the scientific method, you can make it your life to investigate that. Uh, your whole life, every, you know, what you get up for in the morning can become your passion. And living and doing what you love and loving what you do is just, you know, that's the secret to sort of happiness as a professional individual, I think. Tom, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Max. Thank you.